Um, I just got back from Italy two days ago and uh, I was amazed to see how popular it was there. But in the process of writing it, I went to visit the Air and Space Museum and I, they had an exhibit of the, uh, the USS Enterprise, the, the Starship. And, uh, and it was the most popular exhibit in the history of that museum. Now think about it, it was far more popular than any of the spacecraft there that had actually ever been in <laughs> outer space. And the first time I saw that, I thought, you know, gee, that's really bad. But I realized that that's not so bad because we can use the Enterprise as a vehicle to propel us to the stars. It clearly motivates people. And so why not touch on something that really motivated people a lot to talk about, in fact, my own enjoyment of the real universe. And I want to use it as a vehicle to, to really soar to the real stars. So we'll do that tonight. But, in fact, there's a more serious purpose. And my friend Stephen Hawking wrote the foreword for, uh, for the physics of Star Trek. And he said, um, science fiction like Star Trek is not only good fun, but also serves a more serious purpose, that of expanding the human imagination. And this is particularly poignant for Stephen to have said. He said, we may not yet be able to boldly go where no man or woman has gone before, but at least we can do it in the mind. So I want to do that tonight. Take a voyage of the real universe and the Star Trek universe and compare where they touch and where they don't with our minds. And so let's do that now. Now, um, I want to begin with... Uh, Space, the final frontier. Now, we're going to get to the wonders of Einstein and curved space and wormholes and warp drive. And I brought a warp drive and a wormhole with me, actually, so, so you'll see it. But, but first, like any good physics students, before we get to Einstein, we've got to get past Newton. And um, that's a problem. And uh, it's, as I say, it's a problem for, the, for Star Trek as well. Uh, because this is a problem. I had this slide up when Armand was, was, was talking, and, and it's, a, it's a galaxy. It's not our galaxy. Why? <laughs> I just want to check to see. Okay. Okay. We, we, yeah. Okay. I want to see if you're awake. Okay. We, uh, we live in our galaxy. Most of us live in our galaxy. You don't put over there, but that's a different thing. But, uh, um, and this is a galaxy that, you know, far, far away. And uh, it's actually not that far away. It's the Andromeda galaxy. It's the nearest large galaxy to our own. And um, if, uh, if we were living, if this were our galaxy, we'd sort of be living in a boring suburb, right? I don't mean Tempe or anything like that. I mean where the, the sun is, right on the edge of the Milky Way. But, you know, this is a spiral galaxy. Once you've seen one, you've seen them all, more or less. And this is the stage on which Star Trek has played. And it's a really big stage. And that's the problem. It's about 100,000 light years across. We use light years. We don't measure distances in miles because there's too many zeros. It takes, it takes light 100,000 years to cross the galaxy. And that's a problem. Because even if you're going at the speed of light, okay, it takes you 30,000 years to get to the center of the galaxy. That does not make for an exciting episode. <laughs> now, so that's a problem. And, um, and it's a really big problem for the actors. In fact, every time Jean-Luc Picard says engage, he's committing suicide, which is at least a problem for him. Now, I want to try and explain that. So, um, does anyone here have a Ferrari? Harmon? Um, <laughs> no. Uh, okay. Is there, just, oh, does anyone here drive like they have a Ferrari? Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, that, that'll work. Um, well, let's say if you, have, you have a Subaru. And, um, uh, and you're at a stoplight and you gun the engine, okay? So you know what happens. You get pushed back in your seat, okay? And we call that G-force. Astronauts and jet pilot fighters, jet fighter pilots uh, call it G-force. And, and it's really quite simple. It's a law of physics. When you accelerate forward, you get pushed back into your seat. And if you're accelerating forward, at the same rate that gravity would accelerate you down, would it, let's say if I jumped off the stage, gravity would accelerate me down. If you're accelerating forward at that same rate, we call that 1G. You'll be pushed backwards into your seat with a force equal to your own weight, 1G. If you're accelerating forward at twice the acceleration due to gravity, 2Gs, you feel a force equal to twice your weight pushing back against the seat. And three times the acceleration due to gravity at 3Gs, you feel like two people are sitting on your chest. Well, some people are used to that, others aren't. But in any case, <laughs> the, the, uh, you don't want to have that for too long. And in fact, that's the maximum rate of acceleration that uh, the space shuttle astronauts experience just before they go into orbit. Now, here's the problem, you see. A Ferrari 
You can go from zero to 60 miles per hour in I think 4.7 seconds. Okay? Now, when the, uh, when the Enterprise is just cruising along at an impulse drive, not warp drive, just impulse drive, it's going half the speed of light. Okay? It's about 100,000 miles per second. So imagine instead of trying to go from zero to 60 miles per hour in 4.7 seconds, imagine trying to go from zero to 100,000 miles per second in 4.7 seconds. You understand why the writers said you'd be turned into chunky salsa on the back of the spacecraft, okay? Because your seat would literally come up and crush you, okay? You'd be dead in an instant. Their g-forces would be so great you wouldn't survive. Now, um, in fact, early on in the series, some anal physicist undoubtedly wrote in and complained about that. So um, the Star Trek writers invented inertial dampers, okay? <laughs> now. These, these are devices which, in fact, cushion you from any blow, including the blow from acceleration. And they're the things which whenever, in every episode, they always, whenever they go bad, you know, when there's have to do this and, you know, jump across. And because, you know, then you can feel the, 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 the you get the shocks of, of distant uh, phaser fire or whatever. And so, um, now, but they cushion you from the blow from your own acceleration, and that's the reason the actors can survive, and the, particularly the characters they play in Star Trek can survive uh, the shock of accelerating from zero to 100,000 miles per second. Now, how do they work? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, I, I do know that, that, in fact, it wouldn't be, it's not, it's not trivial to imagine how to make them, because remember, you're trying to get by Newton's laws here. And it's one of the biggest misconceptions about science in general that I know of, is that somehow scientific revolutions do away with everything that went before them. You know, that, and that, that's exactly wrong. What has satisfied the test of experiment today will satisfy the test of experiment a million years from now. And a million years from now, if that's the next time the Cleveland Indians are in the World Series, <laughs> then, then uh, you know, when, when a baseball is hit by a bat, it will follow a trajectory described by Newton's laws. Regardless of what we learn about physics at microscopic scales or at the extremes of scale, baseballs and cannonballs will be, still be described by Newton's laws. And you're trying to get around them here, so you can't just do minor surgery. You have to do major surgery on the laws of physics to build an inertial damper. Now, actually, I do know kind of what you'd have to do to make such a thing, at least what, what in principle you'd have to do because you can think about it. Some of you will be bored during the, t the talk and you can think about how to make a nurse lamper. And then you, during the question period, if you haven't figured it out, you can ask me or if you're interested. Because I want to I wanna actually go past it and I want to get to Einstein because Einstein created far more problems um, than Newton did. And um, the, first, um, the first problem he actually created was in fact uh, uh, due to one of the remarkable facets of special relativity, which is that um, when you speed up, your clocks slow down. Okay? And that's not science fiction. It's really true. If you're, at, if you're going very close to the speed of light, your clock will be slowed down compared to mine if I'm watching you. And again, as I say, that's not just, just in, in, in movies. We test it every single day in undergraduate physics laboratories around the world and at particle accelerators. It's really true. Clocks slow down. Now, science fiction writers know that. In fact, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, responsible for a lot of really good and really bad science fiction. Um, you know, so if, if, if I'm watching you and you're traveling at near the speed of light and you go to the center of the galaxy, it'll take 30,000 years. But if you're on a spacecraft traveling very close to the speed of light, that trip would just take you, say, two weeks. And it's really true. It's absolutely true that if you were traveling close enough to the speed of light, you could do the trip in, in a couple of weeks or so, or even less. So now, so as I say, science fiction writers realize that, and that means, in principle, that you could travel throughout the galaxy in a single human lifetime. And as I say, good science fiction, the book Planet of the Apes, bad science fiction, the Planet of the Apes, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, 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 they've all been based on that notion. And, um, and that's great, except that's fine if you've got a single spacecraft. But what if you have a federation? over which you want to have command and control. Then you've got a problem, right? It's a, you've got a problem, you send out the Enterprise on a five-year mission, it comes back 50,000 years later, okay? Um, or, or if Kirk, you know, sees a Klingon vessel and, and, and he wants permission from Starfleet to, to, to shoot at it, he calls back 50,000 years later, here's fire, okay? 